I'll start. Oh. Hi everyone, you're very welcome to the iTelia webinar. We are going to start shortly. We're just going to give it a minute or so to let everyone come in. Um, Shauna? Yeah. Um, our speaker is looking for the number to join um, on your email. Um, would I just tell him go through the other link and we'll... Yeah, if he'd like to uh, join as an attendee and I'll, I'll try and email him separately. But Michael can start and give a, a quick overview okay. in any case. No problem. Thank you. Okay, folks, we'll, uh, we'll get started. Um, welcome again to the Ayatelli Expert Talk Series. We have our second talk um, this evening um, in the series, and we will have uh, eight more talks after this. Um, <clears throat> again, my name is Michael McLaughlin, and I'm joined here by Eleanor Maloney as your hosts. We're both from Limerick School of Art and Design. Um, the schedule this th this evening will just be like what we did on Tuesday. So we'll have a the expert talk whenever we get him successfully into Zoom, um, talking for forty minutes. Um, then we will have a five minute break, um, and then we'll go through uh, as many questions as possible after that with uh, Thomas this evening. If you add your questions to the Q and A tab below, uh, that'll be great. Um, you can continue to add them throughout the talk and we'll try and get to them um, as many as possible afterwards. And anybody that needs a translation, remember you can go to the interpretation tab at the bottom of the screen also. So um, while Thomas is getting set up there, I will just say a few words. Um, so it's Thomas Mayo, who's our expert speaker this evening. Thomas is a, a letterpress printmaker. He's based in the Cotswolds in the UK. He creates a wide range of bespoke printed goods, including uh, typographic prints, stationery, and cards. Um, and I suppose the reason we have invited Thomas to speak this evening is because of the type of work that Thomas is doing. It, it directly connects digital design through his graphic design with digital fabrication through the use of laser cutters and CNC cutters with traditional printmaking methodologies through, uh, in most cases, letterpress in, in Thomas's uh, case. So um, I suppose Thomas is part of a, a group of printmakers that are engaging with laser cutters and CNC routers to create their bespoke wood blocks and typefaces. Um, and the type of work, this type of work is encouraging people, I suppose, to, to dust down and oil up and recommission letterpresses all over Europe and all over the world uh, even. Um, and therefore, I suppose the work that they're doing is demonstrating that digital fabrication technologies are enhancing traditional processes rather than replacing them. So I wonder, is Thomas ready? Hello, can to you go? hear me? Yeah, brilliant, Thomas. We have Thomas. So um, <clears throat> welcome, Thomas. And uh, hey, thanks for having me. Whenever you're ready, you can share your screen if you want, and uh, you can get started. Oh, okay. You can't see me, right? Um, oh, well, we can see you, but we are you sharing some slides? Uh, I was just going to give you a tour of the workshop and show you my my work and some of the machines. Um, is that okay? Yeah, yeah. So far ahead. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. No problem. So I've actually got a friend here, James. is going to help me out. Um, he's a printer too, so he's going to hold the camera. Um, brilliant. So, um, thanks for coming, everyone. Um, if you want to just, yeah, follow me, James. Um, this is the whole sort of workshop here. We've got um, quite a few less press printing presses over here. Um, this big old sort of barn is in the middle of uh, the Cotswolds, uh, Gloucestershire. So um, I moved here from East London where um, I had uh, 
um, a, a big place in uh, Hackney Wick, and um, it basically uh, got knocked down to build luxury flats. So I've moved out here to have more space, and it's a lot cheaper. Um, so yeah, I mean, all of this stuff, as you can see, it takes up a lot of room. Um, it's the all sort of you know big chunky machinery. Um, we have two large format freezing presses. Uh, these are for big scale prints. So the largest sort of paper size on these is like this size. Um, it's about 800 by 540. Um, so these do the, <coughs> let me sort of show the process quickly. Um, you, you feed your paper in here. Just move that. There's ink usually on these rollers, so the mess oscillates as these turn. And then you just roll. So all of these presses here, they do pretty much the same thing, they're just different sizes. These two are the same size. These are slightly smaller, so you use, if you're going to do a smaller print, you use these smaller ones. Um, and I've got collected these over the years. They're all from um, different areas of Europe. Uh, these are in Germany. Uh, this, this one is, actually, no, that, these are Belgium. This one's from Germany. Uh, and I can't remember, it's somewhere else. Anyway, um, it's taken me a long time to sort of collect these presses and drive, you know, vans over to Europe and, and pick them up and bring them back. Um, they seem to be a lot cheaper on the continent, so um, it's always worth sort of doing that, making effort for that. Um, over here we have the um, cylinder Heidelberg, which is um, for, <clears throat> essentially it's the same process, of course, but this is more of an automatic press and it does you can print very large um, quantities of posters um, quite quickly. So, um, James, if I can just grab that off you. Um, round here we have laser cutter over there, which I'll show you. Uh, Thomas, Thomas, yep. just be careful. I think your hand is covering the microphone. Oh, sorry. Can you hear me now? Yeah, we can hear you perfectly now. Thank you. Yeah, brilliant. Um, okay, so this is engraved in cherry, um, and it's um, prepared to type high, which is 23.32 millimeters, really annoying number. Um, so that's the thickness of the wood at the printing height. Um, so this is then locked into here. Um, you put this down, and then James, if you want to hold it again, just careful of the uh, mic on the bottom. <clears throat> so this kind of gets it running. You have your different speeds here. So this is the slowest speed, but you know, getting really crank up. I mean, I won't go much faster because. Something bad would happen, I reckon. Um, so, yeah. So it evens a little off actually, isn't it? Take it on from the bottom. So you can kind of see the nice grain textures in the wood comes through. And um, you can adjust the amount of ink um, and pressure. 
by adding more sheets of paper around the cylinder so you get uh, it's not a good example to show you really. Um, so you can, uh, there's not really much pressure there, but you can get some real nice bite in the paper. Uh, and that's really the, the really nice quality of, of letterpress is the way that you can punch the design into the paper and get that really nice sort of tactile finish. Um, so yeah, that's that machine. Um, then over here we have the, another Heidelberg, which is a um, platen press. Um, again, a very sort of automatic machine, uh, but operated entirely differently. You've got an impression lever here, handles here to get it going. Um, you may as well plug it in. Eh? Sorry, I'm just turning this on. So on this one, all of your ink goes in a duct here. This thing gets spread through here, through these inking rollers. Um, and then, these inking rollers go over your type, which is locked in vertically. And then it just runs by this arm, push it out. And again, you have the speed control. So the machine behind all of the uh, engraving is this, it's an uh, Epilogue 36 EXT. Uh, it's a 60 watt machine. Uh, it's probably about 15 years old now, so it's quite, you know, it's had its day, but uh, it still works quite well. As you can see, massive bed, so you can engrave and cut this whole area. Uh, it's about, what's it? 915 by 610 uh, millimeters. Um, I've just been cutting actually a block for a commission um, with some prints. So you can see here, this is just one of six blocks uh, for a letterpress commission uh, print. And um, the thing about this machine is for any letterpress printer, you, you have the ability to uh, make your own um, relief blocks, right? So. You know, instead of sending away to get some photopolymer made or a, or a magnesium plate made, you can just make them in-house. Um, there are limitations to the, um, you know, your um, detail that you can, you can get from the, the engraving. Um, but these are, um, you know, if you're doing some sort of large text like this, um, it really is actually fine. Um, and this is just... Um, like a high quality hardboard that's taped down on some cheap MDF. So, I mean, to have that made up by someone in, uh, in you know, magnesium would be a couple of hundred quid, I guess. But, you know, that's cost me about fiber materials. So it's not too, not too bad. Um, so that's one way of making a, your, your less rest block. Um, I then use, um, when I'm making wood type, so the process is kind of similar. You engrave a piece of a letter right, onto a piece of wood. This is, um, this is quarter sawn maple uh, that's been engraved to, it's not that deep, but that's maybe two or three passes on the machine. Uh, it's then clean, I then clean it just some water to, to get all the dirt out. And then 
and you can cut it down on this, on this saw. So the saw is, um, if you sort of zoom out a bit, James, this is a fundita. This is um, how they used to cut down, I guess, type back in the day, but mostly um, slugs of lead for newspapers. Um, and you, so you have your points and pikes here on a ruler. Um, but there really is, there's no sort of a saw really on the market that can hold a piece of type or a piece of whatever you want to cut, you know, this size. Um, and just slice off. You can take off point by point, which is really handy. Um, so yeah, you can see there, you can just take off point by point and there's no danger, you know, you're not going to trying to hold it near the saw blade or anything, it's really, really quite safe. So that's that. Um, okay, do you want to come over here, James, and go through some of the work? So um, is it all okay at the moment? You can hear, everything's fine? Everything's perfect, Thomas, thank yeah, you. Brilliant, okay, go ahead, just check it. Okay, so um, James, come around here. So basically, um, I, I was just going to run you through a few things that I've done sort of over the past uh, few years. Um, one of them is this. Um, in one of the pictures I sent for the um, for my sort of pictures of my work, my recent work, there is one that's of the um, installation at Farringdon Station. So this is a memorial to uh, Edward Johnston who designed the underground typeface um, and all of the branding and everything. Um, so basically at, this, at the station, they have this permanent installation and it's an A to Z of giant wood type, lowercase wood type, um, designed by Fraser Muggeridge Studio. And it's, it gets to J and then spells Johnston and then carries on with the alphabet. So there's loads of these letters, you know, this size. So the G is um, actually the largest letter um, because as a lowercase letter, you have this extra space on top. Um, and these were made, uh, the whole size of the installation actually went off the size, maximum size to be printed on this press. So this just fits in, as you can see. So, we then used the G to do all of the texts. Um, and then, um, so you can see, like, uh, sort of early um, test runs, really. So this was, I can't remember what wood that is now, actually. Um, but they are you know, different styles. This was in maple. Um, you can kind of see it banana so we put these steel rods in the back but that didn't even help and um, went through so many different stages of um, you know development trying to get this thing right and and also um, the, you know the main thing was if it was going to be on the wall forever or for as long as what you know five years or so ten years um, we wanted it to stay completely flat there's no way we want you know the, the letters we're going to stop shifting around and popping off the wall. Um, so we decided to go with um, smaller plank lengths, quarter sawn. So instead of the wood shifting, sort of banana ring, it would just pull itself out straight. If it was gonna have any movement at all, it would just be, you know, straighten it out, if anything. So um, these, each plank here, there's smaller numbers of planks glued together and the grain goes in different directions in each case. So it pulls it straighter, uh, nice and flat. Um, they are then um, 
inked up to make them look like they have been printed a lot. Um, that was sort of Fraser Muggeridge's uh, idea that they wanted the whole installation to look like it had been there for a long time or the, the, the type had just come out of a print shop, you know. So um, we did a lot of, uh, James actually helped in this one, we did a lot of um, sort of faux inking. Um, so all of this is actually water-based ink. Um, we couldn't use my, the normal ink that I use. It's like uh, oil-based because of fire eggs. Um, so we, we basically added all this pattern all around it. We did wow. then print all of the letters. Um, you can see one here. A uh, nice bit of grain texture in there. Um, and so there's a whole alphabet printed, um, ready to go into a big sort of book edition uh, at some stage. Uh, that's sort of been kicked back a bit at the moment because of obviously the um, COVID and stuff, but I'm hoping to get that in production soon. Um, this is another letter we made. Um, so these are all made um, on a very large CNC machine and um, they could be engraved on there, but it would probably take about, I don't know, seven hours to engrave that um, at that nice depth. And you wouldn't get this very nice smooth finish. It would be quite blackened. Um, so the, the, I decided to go with a, a local CNC router. Um, and just so it happens, there's one down the road. I mean, we are really in the middle of nowhere here. And there's a guy just five minutes away with all of the tools, so that was that was really helpful. Um, and you can see again another G, uh, this time with different um, uh, finishes on there. So that was that. Um, that was that project. Um, one of the biggest things I've done so far. Um, there's an, an, another one to be made actually for the local university. Uh, different, obviously. Uh, a different project but again with very large pieces of wood type so that should be good. Um, I then make uh, smaller pieces of type so to make this print that I designed this is from um, do you want to come on here Jim? So um, this is from um, based on uh, a wood type alphabet and I add in this, the shadows. Uh, so the two colors um, then make a third when they're overprinted. So we call it chromatic uh, wood type. Um, and again, that's just engraved on the laser or into cherry, that one. Uh, again, same sort of thing here to make these letters um, engraved this maple this time. Uh, maple and cherry, just both very nice words, very hard. Um, and um, sort of they can withstand the pressures from, from printing. Um, what else have we got? Right, so I, again, back to the printer's fists. I really like, I don't know why, just I really love them, the designs. Um, I've recreated them. This one's designed by my friend Jed Palmer, who's a sign writer. Um, Again, it's engraved in maple, <laughs> same whole story. Um, and yeah, uh, this one uh, I found, I saw actually in Whitstable, there was one print, um, a picture of one on the wall. So I took a photo and I, um, I just drew around it on uh, Illustrator and engraved it. And then I thought, how do we make this, you know, take this to the next step? So what I've done is I've made the world's biggest printer's fist. Um, so I can just get this out. I don't know you see it at all. Um, so this is on cherry, uh, all sanded to type height 23.32 millimeters and then shellacked um, at the end to give it a nice finish. Uh, hasn't been printed yet. Um, there is a printing press in Leeds called the People Powered Press. And I've done some work with them before. Um, 
with Anthony Burrell, who's a, a printmaker, and um, this is a, a new project that uh, me and the guys there will do together. Um, but hoping to get a world record for this um, because they've got a world record for their for their printing press, um, which has been made to print um, big big stuff like this. So that'll be really fun. Hopefully, do, doing that this summer. Um, I was going to show. Oh uh, yeah. So one of the first jobs I had actually was um, with Jameson Whiskey. Um, so you can see they, they did a, a whole uh, rebrand, global rebrand with a design company called Pony. And they, um, yeah, they, they, you know, they did a whole, I think it was four or five different typefaces of different weights of a typeface. And um, I then engraved them on, I had a very cheap Chinese laser cutter. Um, and it, you can see the difference, you know, compared to the finish you get now, this very nice clean cut to the black. Um, so I had to just cut all of the letters, a uh, whole A to Z, a workable type sort of um, workable um, scheme, we call it, of type. So you have, you know, three A's and four B's or whatever. Um, and then that was printed by my friend Jamie Murphy in, um, in, at the uh, Salvage Press uh, in Dublin. So I had to make all of the sort of blocks and stuff. Um, one interesting thing with this project though, I, I spent so long in shellacking and sanding all of the, the, the wood to make it so nice and clean. When they printed it, they didn't get the sort of grain texture or anything that they wanted because they were then gonna digitize the font and then use that across all of their digital stuff. Um, so Jamie actually had to sort of throw it, all of the type in a bag and rough it all up and um, scratch it and put bits of dry ink in the printing and you know, it's quite funny. Um, but yeah, there you go. Um, so uh, yeah, it's about it really. There's all sorts of, you know, this was a, a test to make a tiny, um, well, just the normal size uh, Johnston Sands G. Uh, and then obviously the big one there. Um, we have over here, uh, I make blocks for, well, this was for um, a company called Tom Pigeon who do sort of art prints. Um, these were, this is for an edition called Play. Um, and these are all sort of connected to, together on, on, on a press and then print. Um, so there's, there's many possibilities of your design, you know, you can change them around and stuff. Um, so that was fun. Um, this one was with Anthony Burrell. So, and uh, the designer's foundry as well. So he designed this typeface and I cut it out of, uh, again, engraved into maple. I just grabbed Yeah, so that was the size. Um, okay, um, some of the another uh, poster that I've done. Um, if I show them over here, guys. So it, it's a, an easier, uh, cheaper way of doing this actually is to, um, once you have your design, you can just cut, uh, laser cut out of, the, out of a piece of ply and stick that down onto a thicker piece um, of plywood like that. Um, it gives the same result. Um, so if you're, you know, if you don't have any type by wood to spare, it's quite easy to do it this way. Um, but if you have some very fine details, it's easy. It's best to engrave those out of the ply before and stick them down. So that's how that's done, and those are printed on on this press as well. Um, sometimes I do some. Uh, this is a screen for it, but this is um, my job was to add impression. So 
um, my friend um, um, Al Manson at Manson's Press, he did the screen printing, it's really nice. Um, and then I, you can sort of see the pressure through the back. This is just a test one, so it's a bit rough. But um, I, I'll grab the plate. I made these big, I had these made up actually, very large um, magnesium plates. So this is sort of what I was referring to earlier. Um, the laser is really uh, handy because to sort of have something like that made up, I think this cost about 600 quid. You know, it's just crazy. And um, I had to have it made up instead of using the laser actually in this case, because there was so much pressure to be applied to get the the depth that the client wanted on this, um, that I had to use the, the magnesium. But um, yeah, it's, it, it, I mean, it's quite a job really just, just to add just a bit of texture, but that's what they wanted, so. Um, okay, so that's that. And then we've got, um, one of the sort of long-standing jobs I've had uh, is for um, a company called Cafe Belleville, and they're a coffee company in Paris. And I, well, they've changed their designs now actually, but I used to print the, um, if you come out here, James, to show me this. Um, there were, I think, six different designs, um, all designed by my friend Jed Palmer, the sign writer. And, um, they wanted to have something that was um, a bit more tactile and um, it didn't just look like it had been printed, you know, on a digital printer. Um, so they were great, actually. They they just told me to um, do it how exactly how I wanted to. Um, and so the whole thing is, you know, each design has, I think there's four or five colours. Uh, print them four up in on this chase, and that chase is printed on in the um, this um, the platinum press right there. Um, so you can see there's for each one there's a another block again maple type height in, in laser engraved, um, and then yeah, sort of four or five blocks um, per color per. Um, the design, so that was a really nice job. Um, I think that's it, really. I um, think we have some questions. Oh, okay. How are we doing? Is that um, if I just turn this around? Hey, yeah, <coughs> hey. we can. Uh, your, your workshop is uh, sorry, I'll just turn on my camera so people can see me as well. Um, well, your workshop's amazing. I think that uh, a lot of printmakers would be delighted to have one of them machines, never mind a, a warehouse. <laughs> Yeah, it's taken a while to uh, to get them. Uh, it's you know, I've been I suppose I've been doing this for about ten years now. So um, yeah, it's it's taken it's taken some time, but um, yeah, there's always room for more. Though you know, um, it's a bit like you know collecting things, but yeah, and and like you said, they're from all over as well. The, the automated <laughs> one that you showed us, what age is that? Uh, so there's two automated ones. There's the um, the cylinder here. Um, they always have a sort of um, century of Heidelberg on them. Uh, this says 1850 to 1950, so that would be yeah, 50s. Um, and this one over here, uh, 1970. So they're all at sort of similar age actually around that. Um, this is one of the last ones I think to come off the production run. Um, they, because it's got yeah yeah they're, they're all they're like i said they're all class and um, they um the most of the work that you described i i, I have seen before because i've been following you for a while but the uh, oh, right, the jameson work i didn't know that that was you when it when jameson did all of the animations of their new of the brand that they created was that all of the animations of all your your um, type blocks yeah um i made a few of the I can't remember the, the terminology that they use now for the the, the, the sort of figures, 
but um, I've made a, about four or five, I think, different ones. So then they could, um, Jamie could print them and then um, then they could animate them as, as they wanted to. Um, <clears throat> but yeah, that was that was an interesting one. There's there's actually a video on, on I think it's on YouTube. If you search, um, I don't know, Jameson Whiskey um, Wood Type or something like that, it will come up with um, a whole, um, they, they, they came and shot a whole video of the, the process. So if, if anyone's interested, it's, it's quite fun to watch. It's quite a fun little clip. Great. Uh, Thomas, we might actually, if it's okay with you, we'll take five minutes uh, um, of a break and give you a chance to, to catch your breath or get a glass of water or whatever. And I'm yeah, myself, sure. myself and Eleanor are just going to go through the questions and then in five minutes time, we'll come back again and we'll ask some of the questions that the uh, participants have asked. Would that be okay? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I look forward to it. So we'll come back at uh, 16.43, okay? Okay, yeah, perfect. Okay. Thanks.
Hey, Thomas, are you there? No. Hey. Great. Yeah. How are you now? Um, if it's okay, I'll actually start off with a, a question of my own first, just so for for the 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 audience, for people who don't know who like Anthony Burrell is or don't know his work or or Tom Pigeon, um, can you explain a little bit about your clients and how you pick up your clients? Um, so I would say actually Instagram has been probably the, the best way of um, or the, the best tool of, of finding people or, or them finding me because I've never really been one to have like a professional website, everything. Um, I'm not really sure why, but um, I guess mainly concentrating on, on trying to do the work really um, and not being that skilled at making this a website. Um, but Instagram has really been the best tool to sort of get everything out there um, quickly, um, not thinking too much about it, you know, just, just snapping away and, and um, and get and getting instant feedback really from people, um, uh, and them show you know to them sort of can, they can then see the process, um, uh, and that's how yeah like Anthony Burrell, um, who he's yeah you know he's quite a, a big name I suppose in, in the mm. print printmaking world. Um, yeah, it's how he got in contact, um, you know, uh, and same with Tom Pigeon. Um, and, and and loads of people, you know, even the TFL London job was through somewhat through uh, Fraser, who then um, he he then um, sent me a, a DM, I think, on on Instagram. So yeah, it's really been it's really been that um, people coming to me uh, through through that uh, way. Yeah, so it's been quite good. Great to see how, how powerful it is. Um, all of the images that you're sharing that, you know, you can get such big name clients just from Instagram. It's fantastic. Um, yeah, yeah, no, it's, it's been really good. Um, but I, I think that really is the way um, it is now for a lot, a lot of people. Um, you know, you don't really need such a web, big website. I mean, it's good to have, of course. Um, but yeah, I, I think if people can sort of see what you're up to on a daily basis, then that that reminds them that you're there um, and, you know, that they might think whatever you're doing now, you know, the new thing, whatever that could be incorporated in their job that, that they want you to do. So yeah, it's, it's a great tool. We have a lot of um, sort of a very practical questions for you. Um, okay. The first one is what wood do you, do you use? Um, and I suppose I, I, I was also wondering, you know, I think a lot of traditional, uh, wood blocks would be made made with end grain, isn't that right? So it, yeah, that's right. Yeah. Do you still use end grain, or is it uh, just normal slabs of wood that you'd be using? So um, there's end grain is used for uh, up to a certain size because you think of the sort of cross cut of a tree that that's that's the end grain, um, and it depends on the size of the tree really. Um, you know, you can't really get very large bits. I mean. So this, for instance, is side grain. Um, side grain was used normally um, for stuff over a certain size uh, in, in wood type making. Um, you know, but then if I get these really old pieces, I mean, these are original pieces here. You know, these are all side grain. Um, I'm not too sure what these are. Um, they used to use pear quite a bit. Um, sort of fruit woods, um, but I I I hardly ever use um, end grain because um, it's it's just harder to to get uh, to sand on the, the sanding tools that I, I use down at the uh, sawmill um, near to me. Um, they you need to have more of a plank to slide through the um, sander. So if you had end grain sort of slabs, they, they would sort of fly off and it just, it wouldn't really work. Um, and also it's easier to cut on the saw if it's side grain. Um, so you, it, the whole process is just a lot easier. And, um, you, you know, it, it's, end grain is really, you know, it's obviously, it's tougher, but it's not, it's not that tough really. If, if your wood's good quality, and it's dried, um, you shouldn't really need end grain. 
to be honest. It, it's just more of a um, more of a hassle really than it's worth, in my opinion. But um, yeah, um, mainly mainly side grain. Okay, sure. and I assume the originally it was used they used end grain because of the the pressure of the presses. It needed to be that strong, um, but you don't need that particular pressure anymore, I assume. Uh, well, the, the pressure's probably stayed the same, yeah. Um, but um, I, I suppose they were they were thinking of the, the longevity of the of the um, of the block, mm. um, and and you know I can make stuff ag again. Or most of the wood that I use for for a project is only used, you know, a couple of times to print. Um, and you know, if, as long as you go easy on the pressure, I mean, even yeah, you know, having said that. Some of the, the wood I use for the, the um, so those nice prints, for instance, um, those were um, they go through the press about you know a thousand times. So and there's no real change in the the the, the, the form or, or structure of the wood. So it, I don't know really. I, I'm, I'm not sure if it's really necessary to use any grain, to be honest. And I suppose the other part of that question that. Uh... Lisa had was uh, the, the the type of wood. So is it is it all maple that you'd be looking at? I, I heard you mention cherry as well. Is there any? Yeah. Is it used? Yeah. So use maple and cherry. Um, I've used when I did um the the MA at the University of Gloucestershire, and I used I sort of as part of the project was to use every sort of material I could think of. So I've used it. I've tried out most you know pretty much every sort of species, but. Um, maple I just is a nice word I found to engrave. Um, it engraves quite easily, um, and it's not. Um, it, it's uh, it also quite nice, just the visual sort of aesthetics of it. Uh, I think that's quite important. Um, cherry as well has that really nice finish, uh, like the giant fist. Um, that's out of cherry, um, and the. Yeah, the, all of the TFL letters were made from cherry too. So um, it was more down to the aesthetic, like the, the finish of them and how they look once they've been cut and and um, and used. Um, I mean, you could use any sort of material really. It doesn't have to be, a, a, you know, it could be more synthetic and, and it could print better really. But it, it really depends on the projects in question and. The demands of, of the client and, and you know yeah there's, there's many variables but mainly cherry and maple are my sort of go-to species i use yeah um helen has a question for you uh thomas um uh, it, it's actually onto the same thing um just you were mentioning about the warping and that you've meant you've like you tried several ways of trying to to solve that problem what yeah. was the final result of that? Because it wasn't really quite clear in the camera. It seemed like you made almost a butcher's block <laughs> um, stuck together, but I couldn't really tell. So that's Helen's question. I was just yeah, no, that's, that's a good way of putting it, actually. Um, I sort of refer to it as breadboard. Um, so, yeah, it's, um, I think, I think that's why, yeah, butcher's blocks and th they were made with sort of alternate grains you know, in, in many slabs stuck together. Um, so then when they warp, they just sort of pull the board flat. Um, I think there's there's loads of different variables um, and those then differ between species of wood. Um, so for instance, the cherry, um, that the, if you just have side grain and it's not completely kiln dried, then it will start to warp a lot. And we found that with the, sort of the, the first um, test that we did. Um, we ended up using the cherry um, that was kiln dried. Um, I'm not sure about the process of kiln drying, but I guess obviously le left in a, a hot oven really for a long time, um, just to completely get rid of the moisture. Um, but the, we ended up using more than sort of it was supposed to be three or four very sort of large, like thick planks. Um, but then we decided to use um, smaller planks, more of them, and have um, kiln dried and have the, uh, the grain directions varying. 
um, as they're glued together. So that made actually quite a secure board. Um, but I mean, you know, for instance, the, the massive fist um, that's been made, um, cut that last year. And, um, you know, some days in here, I'll look and it's against the wall and it will sort of be bananaing a bit. And then a week later, it'll be bananaing the other way. And it's just, wood is just this really um, annoying thing, you know? Um, <laughs> It's annoying for precision, precision. Yeah, exactly. precision and, and that's yeah. weirdly yeah, that's, the, that's, what, is what makes it unique as well, isn't it? So each piece is different because each piece of timber is different. Yeah, yeah, that is um, that's a good way of putting it as well, really. Um, but yeah, it, it it's quite it's um, it's quite hard to get just right, I think sometimes. Um, Actually, but, yeah. I'm just going to jump in there with my own question ahead of everyone else now because I can. Um, <laughs> the 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 printer's fist. Where is where did that come from? What is it used for? Like, what does that icon mean? So I'm led to believe that um, uh, you know, back in the day, um, it's I, I mean I've seen them on old playbills and posters, you know, from the, I guess back in the sort of 1800s, maybe that far um where they've sort of been pointing to some information so you know a heading or a headline sorry or like um a, a, an image or something you know it would just have a, a, a hand that's pointing it's, and it's always like a gentleman's hand with like a, a suit jacket and a shirt with a button sometimes and um i mean there are so many different designs um there's there's, um, yeah, I mean, I, I've got about four or five different designs that I use, um, but I just thought it would be quite interesting to, to make the world's biggest one. But um, yeah, we'll see how that comes out. Hopefully be able to share that um, in the summer. The, when you're talking about the precision of timber there, um, you also mentioned during your talk that, you know, the, the pieces have to be type high when they're going into those particular machines. and and. I assume some of those machines are different type high, are they as well? So you need different heights for different machines? That's right. Um, I, yeah, there's, um, I think there's about five different type heights or maybe more, could, could be completely wrong, but there are different areas of the world have different type heights. Um, so the British type height is 0.918 of an inch, which is, you know, 23.32 millimeters. Um, and it's just been a number that's really, um, it's you know I, I go into woodworking shops and I ask them can you make this wood to this height and they just sort of laugh you know <laughs> and you know because it can just change in in moisture you know to that point two or whatever um, so yeah it, it, it's tricky but there's um, you're you're dead right though because I mean these machines are all um, European type height which is um, I've got a sort of um, a roller gauge that's got the, the number on it, but it's I think it's 23.56. So it's just a little bit over. And, and do, you, do you go to wood workshops to make them that the slabs that particular height for you or do you those capabilities yourself? So um, I get the, um, I get the sawmill to, to, they've got this very accurate um, uh, milling machine. Um, which can take it down. It doesn't go to so 23.32 20, millimeters, but theirs goes to just the 0.3 or 0.4. And I find that's, that's close enough, you know. Um, but you, I mean, for these ones, there's actually, um, you just bump up the, the base. So you add, this has got like a thin sheet of metal here. Mm -hmm. That puts it up to, to the 23.32 instead of 23.56. I see. Um, yeah. I haven't I don't know how they got to those numbers. But. <laughs> It'd be a lot easier if they were all the same for you. But <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I, I have a question here from Finn. So he says, uh, you have some beautiful machines. Um, Thank you. Are they difficult to maintain? Um, not really, actually. As long as you sort of oil them and um, 
you you know you go carefully with them uh the larger ones you have they have a actually a, a sort of um inbuilt oiling system so you just pull oil into this sort of um central um canister and then you pull a lever and then that just pumps oil throughout um the, the, i suppose the hardest thing um is cleaning them after you've used them especially the big ones because you have all of these rollers these just get completely covered in ink and then you have um this one is actually <laughs> You have a big cylinder down, down there as well that's covered in ink. Uh, and then these come out. So you have to sort of take these all apart. And as you can see, I've sort of missed bits <laughs> over the years. Um, so, yeah, it's. Uh, so, I mean, that in terms of sort of maintenance, not too much, not too much work, but. General sort of use of them is, is quite um, quite a lot of work. And if parts break, can you get those parts, or do you have to get them specially made? Then what happens? Oh, sorry. If, sorry if, what? If parts break in the machines. Oh, parts. Um, yeah, they can do. Yeah, um, but I actually um, I know a few sort of engineers that can make whatever um, you want really. So it's not impossible really to get stuff redone uh, or remade. Um, and you can get the rollers recovered, and uh, you know it's it's actually quite simple to to sort it out. And um, if there's anything that's wrong, um, yeah. Um, we have a question here from Dries Verbruggen. So thanks for turning up tonight, Dries. <laughs> he was our first speaker. Um, he uh, wants to know: Have you tried other digital subtractive tools like CNC? It could be interesting to integrate the subtle carving tool marks. Of that process in the printing. Yeah, yeah, no, definitely. Um, so this, I've, I've used CNC. I mean, th that's where I use it. You know, the sawmill. I use the, the CNC there. Um, and three D printing. I haven't really tried that out yet. It'd be quite interesting to, to see that. I know some people have made some letterpress blocks using the um, the three uh, D printing. Um, I think there's an element though of um, with the machine sort of engraved stuff that it's not quite, I don't know, like compared to like a hand lino cut or something, you miss the sort of the, the, the human touch. Um, so um, it would be interesting to maybe use, cut something by hand and then use a CNC with that, something like that, I don't know. Um, but yeah, I do, I do use the CNC quite a lot, but if it's too big for the laser, uh, that's usually when I use it. Uh, when you use the CNC then, um, obviously the CNC has a, a round bit. So if you're doing internal corners, they're not sharp, is that correct? Um, no, well, it depends on the, the CNC. What was that, John? You can use V bits. Oh uh, yeah. Ah, okay. Yeah, to make it sharp. Oh, yeah, perfect. Yeah, and also, I mean, on, on the, the one down uh, the sawmill, it, it's got this huge um, sort of cassette full of different tool bits, um, and it will cut out the large areas, the cleaning out the big sort of blank space, and then the, the, the piece, the cutting head goes back to home, and then it, it this thing whizzes around, mm -hmm. and then it picks out like even like dentistry drill bits, like tiny little pieces. So it, it can cut and, and actually what it does, if you imagine a corner and this is the drill bit, it, it cuts and it sort of moves up and out so it can get even finer corners. Um, so yeah, it, it, they are really, I mean, the, the more advanced ones can really um, can cut any sort of detail really. Um, but you're right, I mean, that's, um, you know, traditional methods of making wood type, they would have a pantograph and that wouldn't have that option. Um, so they would end up having to finish by hand, like into corners. So like into that, that it would just normally cut like a, uh, a circle really there. And then you have to cut with a little tool to finish them. Um, and that's the good thing with the laser is it just will cut or engrave exactly how uh, that's actually 
laser cut and stuck down, but um, it, it can it can just engrave and cut exactly how you want it to to to, to be. So yeah, uh, <clears throat> I'm just I'm just thinking that as you were saying that you know it'd be nice to have some more hand markings alongside the CNC that maybe, you know, after it comes off the CNC, if those parts were done by hand, then that's sort of- Yeah, working yeah, you're right. right. Yeah, but definitely something to, to try out, for sure, yeah. yeah. So I have a question here from Claire. Um, how did you make the plate for the Welcome to My World print? Oh, so there are plate makers out there still. Um, that was a place called Centurion Graphics. They're based in Leeds or not leave somewhere sort of up north. Um, and yeah, you just send off your um, black and white PDF uh, and then they, um, they, they sort of send you a proof and then you okay it and then uh, they just send you the, the, the plate, so. Th that was um, the, the magnesium plate, was it? Yeah, so that's acid etched, I'll grab this one. So this is, one piece of it that I did. I did it in three parts. Um, and you can see there's loads of detail on this. Um, why why is it um, magnesium instead of any other metal? Like why isn't it steel like other print printing parts? Um, so the process behind making this is uh, like an acid etch bath. And it's that what they do is they have like making a screen you have your film um, and it's a negative and that's put over the, 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 the magnesium and then it's exposed and then they take away the film and stuff and then they actually wash out the, the, the sort of the negative space and magnesium is just a sort of soft enough metal to work in that process. And that's just how they've done it, I think, for, for you know, good sort of maybe 100 years. I don't know. Quite a long time. Um, but you can um, you can do the same, but with like a polymer, like a, a very strong plastic. Um, and that you can get polymer plates made just exactly the same as this. Um, but if you're looking to do um, a deboss or an emboss, um, you need a lot of pressure on there. So magnesium is a better um, uh, metal to use. Uh, the, the polymer will sort of start breaking, I think. Um, so yeah, that's, that's that process. Um, I have, well, I have three questions from Tatiana, but I'll, I'll ask them all in the one. <laughs> in the one. Um, I'm guessing Tatiana is from Ukraine. So have you ever had an order from Ukraine? Um, but also what is your background and kind of what's your plan over the next 10 years? Um, so an order from Ukraine was the first one, right? Yep. Um, I haven't, I don't think. I could be wrong. You, you might get one after this. <laughs> yeah, well, I'd love to, yeah, that'd be great. Um, <laughs> yeah, I, I, I think I've had, I think the, the, the coffee labels in Paris is probably as far afield as I've gone with, <laughs> um, and um, yeah, no, I've, I've not had, I don't think I've had anything from Ukraine, um, and how I got, so it was, what was my background, um, was, um, it, so I studied graphic design at university, um, and then I, I suppose I never really wanted to, um, or I was never that good at computer design, um, I, I went, uh, in my second year at university, I went to visit a private printing press so pretty much like this but in an old um gardener's cottage and uh, that just so happens to be about five miles away um and a place called the whittington press you might want to check them out They're, they do really amazing books um all printed in house um and i went to visit one day and then i sort of got the um I sort of started messing around with some wood type. Um, I, was, I was left to my own devices there. And um, yeah, that's sort of how I got into all of this, really. I ended up working there for about four or five years and, um, and then sort of going alone um, on it. Um, um, what was the other question? Sorry, I can't remember. Sorry. Um, just kind of uh, the next 10 years, what are your plans with this? Oh, yeah, good question. 
Um, I, I suppose um, I'd kind of like to just, well, stay in this location. Um, I've moved everything back from London. Um, I moved it to London and then sort of got more stuff and then moved it all back. And it, it's like quite a big process, like job really, as you can imagine, moving all this stuff. So I finally found somewhere that doesn't have like a, um, a limited leasehold on it. Um, and um, yeah, it's about sort of 1700 square feet. So there's, there's enough room to sort of have um, some expansion um, over the next decade. Um, maybe get a bigger Heidelberg um, to do bigger posters and quicker runs. Um, I would like to get a CNC machine in here uh, and build in a wood room um, to basically stop all the sawdust going all over the machines. Um, and I also would like to start doing some workshops. So run like a weekend workshop um, to open that up to everyone. Um, it's just tricky at the moment because of the sort of COVID stuff. Um, Organising those things, um, it takes a bit of a uh, bit more consideration, but I'm sure you know, that would be um, okay in, over the next sort of six months or so. Uh, and also have a, I really want to do like an open day here. So have um, other printers from everywhere around the world come and and man a press and do posters and have every, you know have the doors open and stuff. So um, those are sort of the, the plans really. Um, but yeah, we'll just see see what happens really. Yeah, that sounds good. Actually. <laughs> yeah, I think there, you, lots of people are in the audience who'd love to join a workshop like that. Oh, nice! Well, that'd be great. Yeah, it's really encouraging actually. I have a question here from Chloe. Has Brexit affected your business at all? Yeah, it has actually. So the um, the, uh, the the coffee labels for um, Cafe Belleville, they just decided that um, it would just it was going to be a bit too tricky. Um, and I think they were changing their designs anyway. But they just I think when they were looking for a printer for their for the new designs, they just thought, well, we may as well just get, have them done in Paris, you know, and and save us save the money. Um, so it has been affected by that. I don't know if it's been affected in other ways, really. Um, I mean, I've, it's been, no, it has been tricky actually sending um, machines to, I've, I've just sent a machine actually to Jamie Murphy of um, Salvage Press. And he lives just outside of Dublin. And um, that was a real pain actually sorting that um, because I've sent them to Dublin before and it's just sort of, you know, it gets collected and it's gone um, and it's delivered. But in this circumstance, we had to go through all of this paperwork and um, we weren't sure how much money we'd have to pay and, and not even the shippers knew themselves. So it's been really, um, yeah, it's been pretty, pretty nice. So yeah, I have been affected for sure, yeah. Um, but we'll see to, to how much more extent. Um, I think, well, we hope it'll all get worked out um, between Ireland and England, but it, I, I think everybody's having the same experience that nobody knows yeah. anything, and then you, it's like a surprise bill that you get at the end. Yeah, it's crazy. You just think, I mean, surely, I mean, the, the rules are there, so how, how would no one be able to figure it out? But, um, yeah, never mind, eh? <laughs> um. <laughs> So I have a question here from Nula Donovan. And uh, she said, thanks for the great talk about your work. Um, do you make your work in artist or limited editions or is that something you've done in the past? Yeah, so I do um, I do limited edition runs for, well, for people. Um, and then I might do like a, a poster design and it might be a limited run. Um, but actually it's quite hard to work out if, um, because once you sort of made the block and you've, you've You've done all of that work um you can print out as many as possible really so um to then just limit it to say 100 um it's, it's quite hard to work out if that's a good idea to do or just or have an open edition um and so like for instance the the um the nice prints they are that's an open edition and i'll just do as many as i can um and then but because of that the price is a bit lower um, yeah, does that answer the question? I don't know. 
um, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Um, I have a, a nice, uh, difficult question here from Miriam. Um, your work is great. I really enjoyed your talk. My question is, what does innovation mean for you? Mm, um, tough one, really. Um, well, I suppose trying new things. I, I, I guess I'd like to say that some of this stuff is quite innovative in, in some ways. Um, it's trying out new new techniques. Um, I mean, I really like combining the the, the new sort of um, you know the laser cutters, obviously, and the CNC, um, and and seeing how that can really benefit um, this this old stuff, you know, um, and and sort of the you know the, the possibilities that that then brings to this sort of once sort of dying art form. Um, so I mean. It's, I, I do sort of wonder what's the next step, how to then push it further and further um, to be more in, in, innovative. Um, but yeah, I don't know really. I, I guess we'll see w w as technology develops what the new thing comes along is. Um, but I mean, really with this, it is just making a, a relief plate uh, at the end of the day. Um, but you know, different techniques that might pop up to, to make those those blocks and plates, then I'd be very keen to try out everything really. Yeah, I completely agree. Like the innovation that you're doing is in joining technologies that have never been joined before. Um, mm. and coming out with new possibilities because you're looking at joining different types of technologies and you have the experience uh, and knowledge of a graphic designer um, while using more manual technologies as well. And that's all being come together to create new work. Yeah, that's it, yeah. Um, and I think that leads on to a question from Diego, which is, uh, where do you see the future of printing going? Oh, okay, um, question. Um, well, I mean, they sort of say print isn't dead, don't they? Um, I think it sort of did die, um, but it, there's a, a sort of, bit, because of that, um, it's been brought back to life in, in many different ways. Um, you know, letterpress being one of them. I mean, I hope that letterpress can sort of be around for for a long time because um, a lot, you know, obviously it's been around for a long time. But I hope it can sort of survive um, with the interest of you know of, of you, all you guys and um, and new technologies that are here to help it. Um, to improve or, or just stay, you know, stay alive. Um, yeah, I don't, I don't know really. Um, I think with with letterpress, there's just um, it's just a, a, a process or a method that no other sort of um, method, whether it new or old, can can reproduce um, or, or be close to. So. I think I don't think there's any chance of it sort of dying soon. Um, like I said earlier, it's all about that sort of tactileness and and that sort of stamp of the of the of the block or the you know text or whatever into the into the paper, uh, and, and nothing else can really achieve that. So um, I don't think it could really um, fizzle out quite yet. Um, we have a question from Nicola, um, who is the uh, from Design Crafts Council. Um, he wants to see your laser cutter. <laughs> Please. He wants to see it. Yeah. <laughs> so I think um, we can we can finish up if you want to uh, show us the laser and, and maybe give a, a small explanation of how it works for people who don't know Thomas. That'd be great. Yeah. Oh uh, yeah. Sorry, I, I was going to sort of um, go into that earlier. Um, so. The, um, we see here, you've got my, um, let's just turn it off. Um, so it runs off um, this very old PC laptop. Um, this is actually given to me by my dad. Um, and the reason why it's this is because this, like I think I mentioned, this is about 10, 15 years old now. So um, it's, 
it sort of it won't run off a Mac, and um, you don't really want to have a nice Mac anyway sitting around here because it's so dusty. Um, and anyway, this actually runs off Adobe Illustrator uh, CS2, um, and so you have, for instance, um, you can see the design here, um, which has been engraved here. Um, it runs on like a color, um, uh, sort of uh, each color is a different setting. So you can change the colors and change the settings. So it actually runs off the print drive. So um, you just go into sort of preferences and it opens up the Apple log sort of printing preferences. Um, and then you have color mapping. And then so advanced, so I've got all of my settings here over the years that I've made. Um, for instance, my wood type engrave setting uh, here. Can you see this all right? Is it okay? Um, yep. Yeah, just yeah. about, yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, <laughs> so anyway, color mapping. So then you can change your, as you saw on the, de on the design, it was in green, the area that you wanted to engrave. So you have your um, speed and power and really that's that's all the machine works on is just the speed and the power for your um for your engrave so the quicker it goes uh, and the lower the power the less of the engrave and then slower and more power the deeper the engrave so then you just go okay and then that sends it to the machine um <clears throat> so yeah then you just turn it on and uh, it just homes itself and then engraves. Um, it's actually before um, before the talk, I had it engraving because I wanted to show you the end of it engraving this, um, but it, it's kicked up so much dust that it's got under, there's like an encoder strip along here. And it's now, that now needs cleaning because you can see it's just started to engrave completely off course. So yeah, it's just is you know typical really. I'm just trying to show someone how it works. It's it breaks, but yeah. <laughs> Actually, Mike, sorry, I, I have one question and um, um, about paper. Like, are you particular oh, yeah. about the paper you use? Because we've kind of been working one side of the printing press, but not the other side, which is you know the material that you run through. Or does it matter? Yeah, it does. Yeah, for sure. So there's different papers for different jobs. Um, I use, um, I've actually got, so I'll show you my sort of paper store. Um, so just in my office. So this is sort of all the papers, different kinds. Um, and a lot of sort of old stuff, um, handmade stuff. Um, yeah, that's all that. But um, it really depends on the job and the client and, um, how much the, the budget is. Um, there's uh, handmade stuff you can get. There's mold made. There's, you know, there's so many different types. Um, the um, a sort of go-to one I use is um, GF Smith. So that's all in this little book here. Okay. You guys might have seen this before, um, but I'll just turn this around. So you can see all the different types of paper, different weights, different styles, different colors, everything. Um, but you know, these guys are quite expensive really. Um, so yeah, uh, there's those, or there's, you know, there are places in London, John Purcell paper is really good. Um, I mean, there's, it's all around the world, really different paper makers. Uh, produce different stuff so. and based on on that side of things just one last question if, that, if that's all right with you thomas um yeah. mary has a question i've no knowledge of printing um and i've learned a lot from this i'm curious about the different types of inks with respect to the water versus the oil based mm. are, are there other options and why do you choose one over the other okay yeah uh, yeah good question so there's um I use uh, water-based, actually, sorry, not water-based. I used uh, oil-based. Um, I just find, I'll show you all the inks down here. 
I just find that they uh, adhere to the paper a lot better and they're a lot more, the opacity in them is really good. So you've got um, all different sort of colors here and then I can mix them up on this scale. So um, there's a Pantone book somewhere yeah. um, that's got all of the different colors. Um, I've also got rubber-based inks. The rubber-based ones, they stay open. So, um, that's not that one. Um, but yeah, the rubber-based ones, they, you can leave those on a press and it, they won't dry out. So, um, um, so, for instance, I was saying, you know, the, with the presses, the maintenance and stuff, like cleaning up the press, it often takes some time to do. Um, but if you have rubber base inks, you don't have to really clean them up. Um, at the end of the day, you can leave them if you've still got work, to, you know, want to print the next day. Um, but then actually the, the paper itself, um, the ink on the paper, um, it, they take longer to dry. So if you've got a lot to do, then a lot of prints to do, then they'll end up sort of stacking on each other and offsetting. So um, the, the, the linseed stuff, uh, oil-based, uh, dries a lot quicker. Um, the water-based stuff dries very quickly. Um, and I only use those for um, like a um, workshop where, um, you know, it's with children or um, you know, the health and safety regulations state that you can't use um, the oil-based stuff because it essentially is flammable. Um, I don't know, does that explain it? Yeah, uh, yeah. it does indeed, yeah. And yeah. I suppose what stops the rubber-based paints from drying on the, uh, when they're on the machines? Is it that they have to be spread thinly on the paper for them to actually dry then, or what happens? So I'm not sure the sort of um, the ingredients there, but I guess rubber doesn't dry. Um, as quickly as an oil. Okay. Um, uh, yeah, I'm not too sure. Um, I wish I knew really, but um, I've just always used this stuff and actually it's used in um, offset light though. So um, I, I, it's spread very thinly on offset uh, mach machines, uh, light though machines. Um, so all of these actually I get from, from a, um, a printer, offset light though printer and then I have to add in more um, like a white and a trans um, transparent white as well to bring them down to like a, a letterpress tone because uh, they'd all be too dark um, using the same amount on these presses. Does that make sense? Yep, absolutely. Yeah. Um, I, I think that we've gone through everything, Eleanor, have we? Have you anything else? Um, there's one more question here. It's a almost a philosophical one. <laughs> um, so yeah. it's from Andy Marsden, and he said, "Hi, thank you for the great talk. Uh, in the previous talk of this series, um, there was a discussion about protecting or being guardian of craft. Do you mm. see this as part of your practice, ensuring the continue continuation and modernizing the knowledge base around printing?" Um, so am I a guardian of the craft? Is that sort of, what do you mean? Sorry, yes, that's... Yeah, uh, in some way. Or, or, yeah, or do you see it as a stewardship of a, of a you oh. know, it can be done faster, I suppose. You can just get printers now, right? Everyone has a, an inkjet printer that, you know, they connect to their computer. Do you see yourself as actually protecting this knowledge? Yeah, I, I guess so, yeah. And I'm, I'm you know, like this talk, I'm, I really like... Um, I really like telling people about it all, you know, and um, and hoping that, you know, people will sort of follow on, maybe not in the same exact way or to the same extent, but um, I don't know. I think looking back at the history of all this stuff, it's been, it was so important and it was such a huge part of, you know, um, life really. Every town had its little, you know, printer and, I don't know. Um, there's a lot of sort of nostalgia in there, I think, for me. But um, it's I, I I just hate to see all this stuff just go to waste. And I, I think it it was heading that way, you know, uh, when the sort of computers came in. Um, a, a lot of this stuff was just chucked out. Um, you know, they used to burn wood type because it was so um, 
flammable you know had all of the sort of paraffin on it from the years of use um so yeah there is a sort of there is a aspect of being a sort of guardian i think because um i've managed to collect all this stuff and it's not going anywhere now and you know it's not going to be all sold off um as sort of trinkets and um you know the presses aren't going to be melted down to make you know new stuff it's it's it, it's uh it's protected here and um hopefully used um you know as good as it can be used really um thank you i think that was a pretty <laughs> Uh, articulate answer on, on on that position i mean i i find it unusual actually the fact um that you are using obviously modern technology like cnc cutter and, and laser printer to make mm. sure that the old technology uh, continues to be used i mean it seems like a the perfect marriage at the moment between new technology and old technology to get your work done yeah yeah it's i mean i'm very lucky to to um I, i've gone down this route really um it, it just the computer aided stuff was never really my thing although you know having said that you know the lasers and things wouldn't operate without a computer but um but yeah no it, it's great and uh, i really you know i really enjoy it and i'd love to sort of show people um more people about it um so hopefully you know look out for some uh, some courses that i post about in the next sort of few months absolutely i think we absolutely will thomas and uh, we're getting lots of comments here in the in the comment box here in the q a just saying thanks a million and how good it was to see the inside of your workshop and it's brilliant all of the things that you're doing so actually one comment great. said it was the cleanest printmakers workshop <laughs> that they've ever seen <laughs> well i mean I've, I've got to be honest i have i've spent a couple of days cleaning up so uh, yeah <laughs> hiding up stuff but um no it's, it's so good to uh, to talk to to you guys and um thanks everyone for for you know your your nice comments and stuff it's been great brilliant we'll, we'll, we'll leave it there if any more questions come in thomas we might send them on to you and for anybody yeah. who's in, yeah. if you want to get in contact or see thomas's work go on to his instagram and yeah get everything there thank you very much yeah. all right thanks so much guys enjoy thank the evening you. Good luck. thank you bye now bye 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 bye